University of Arts and Sciences dean, uh, who had been spending his summer vacation reading an article in the ACM uh, communications, Big Data and Its Technical Challenges. Um, and he emailed me and said, Sarah, when I, when I was reading this, I thought of you and the library, and what is the library doing about data? So this was the impetus then for me to review what Harvard had been doing over the past few years and to think about what was needed. And, and actually, I was very pleased. I found that substantial work had been done. Uh, the university archivist, Megan Sniffen Marinoff, so Megan, you're here somewhere, uh, right up in the back, uh, close to the camera, um, pointed me to a policy which helpfully de de defined Harvard research as a uh, research data as a university record. Uh, there was a great policy on data retention and management on the web page of the Vice Provost for Research. And I was sent a 2013 paper on a strategy for e-research support, which had been written by four library staff members. And there was a link to information about information stewardship. I learned that we had helped underwrite Dataverse. And I knew that Chris Erdman and Scott Wicks were running very popular data science for librarians courses. So these were great ingredients, great work, but actually much of what we were doing was either on hold or moving forward unevenly. And our agenda was crowded with other concerns, such as what to do with our growing uh, collection of traditional physical objects and the possible need to spend $25 million on the expansion of our depository. In October uh, 2014, we held a Harvard symposium on trends in print repositories. Uh, there were brilliant and thoughtful papers. And that same month, I headed off to Washington, DC uh, to the Association of Research Libraries meeting. And I happened at one session to sit next to Jim Mullins, uh, who from Purdue, who had um, heard about the Harvard Symposium and said to me, Sarah, why don't we do something like that together on data? And um, I really thought, wow, that's fantastic. Uh, the print symposium was, was marvelous, and I have from afar, long admired Jim's contributions to our understanding of, of data. He's had very early and decisive leadership in this area. He's really a first mover. I can remember, I mean, it was probably, it was back in the days when job ads were printed in, um, in magazines, <laughs> where in 2006, that Purdue had created this job of data research scientist. And I remember thinking from my post then at Cornell, wow, that's a really cool thing. Look what they're doing at Purdue. And Jim had put together, uh, I think, an exemplary program and a very successful program in relation to data and the library's role in working in a university set setting. So it took me about 15 seconds, probably less, to say yes. I, I then uh, returned to Cambridge and asked Connie Rinaldo, who's librarian of the Ernst Mayer Library, Connie, okay, also up in the back there, waving her hand, uh, uh, so uh, of the Museum of Comparative Zoology, uh, she, Connie had been reviewing uh, data management proposals for uh, the Office of Sponsored Program, and I asked Connie to take the lead on this. Uh, Connie and many, many other colleagues, uh, including Artis Kotzbiel, uh, Artis up standing up in the back by the clock, and um, let's see who else, uh, met regularly and held uh, conference calls with Purdue counterparts, uh, including Paul Brack 
and uh, the Associate Dean for Research and Assessment at, at, in Purdue Libraries, and Scott Brandt, the Senior Data Specialist, and Michael Witt, Head of the Distributed Data Curation Center, uh, D2C2. And in addition to those I've already mentioned, Harvard participants in the planning are Betsy Eggleston, Merce Krosas, Andrea Goffels, Catherine Hammond Baker, Mary Murphy, Michael Leach, uh, Michelle Pierce, Tracy Robinson, and Lynn Schmelz. And uh, please forgive me if I've left people out. It really did take a village to put this together. Uh, they drew up the list of speakers, and the program you have here today and tomorrow is the result. Uh, the logistics of the symposium have come under the leadership of Naomi Handler, who uh, might not be in the room right now. Ah, you're right there, okay. Uh, because I thought she might be out making things happen. Uh, she's done the most fantastic job of uh, creating order out of chaos. And I don't know if any of you, years and years ago, I worked in a resort. And uh, you know, if you happen to drop the lobster on the floor in the kitchen, as long as it looked OK when you brought it out to serve the, uh, <laughs> the guest and it was clean, you know, it was OK. And we've had a few little dropped lobsters in our kitchen, but Naomi's got them all straight right now. So that's good. And she's had a whole team of people from the librarian's office and elsewhere helping us. Uh, so the, the next few days are really going to be critical in creating for us at Harvard there's quite a selfish uh, motive in creating a blueprint of action, but also I hope for our community, for uh, the community that extends its libraries, but beyond libraries, its people working in information technology, its people working in uh, research, its people, it's, it's, it's the whole academic community and the foundation uh, community as well. Uh, so I, I hope that it will take it beyond the importance of data for the future to a level of clarity about how we allocate our resources, how we preserve data, how we partner effectively with others. Uh, various of you may be further along on the continuum than, than I am. But the fact that you're here represents an interest and a common hunger for knowledge and activity. Uh, I, am, I am really fortunate to have found uh, inspiration for this symposium in Jim Mullins, the Dean of Libraries at Purdue. He brings to this partnership a very deep experience and insight into data and libraries. And I'm pleased to introduce Jim now. He, you, you know that he has uh, long, many, many years, we're getting long in the tooth, right, you know, of, of, of experience. He came to Purdue from MIT, so I'm sure he's happy to be back uh, in, in Cambridge uh, on this, uh, this assignment. And he's also been at uh, Indiana and Villanova. He has um, degrees from Iowa and a PhD uh, from Indiana University. He's had a number of uh, leadership positions within the American Library Association and the Association of Research Libraries. He's been a member of the ARL Board of Directors and uh, chair of the eScience Working Group, making him eminently qualified to be the co-host of this. So thank you very much, and let us now welcome Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, I just want to say how pleased I am to be here and to follow someone of your eminence, both at Cornell and then at, at Oxford and then here at Harvard. Um, everywhere I go where Sarah has been, she's made an incredible, incredible impact. And I have no doubt the same will be true here at Harvard. So, well, um, data management at Purdue. We're about 10 years, maybe a little over 10 years into this. And I started thinking, what else took 10 years? And then I realized it was the travails of Odysseus trying to get back to Ithaca after the Trojan War. Now, I may be presumptuous, or even it might be preposterous, 
to compare a data management challenge to the Odyssey, but could there be similarities? Both were launched with an altruistic purpose, the return of a kidnapped wife and the recovery of honor, or in the other instance, advancing research through recovery and preservation of data. Both would be, appear to be participants to be a quick and easy journey. I'm sure Odysseus, when he took off, thought, you know, it's a good three-week trip, um, never 10 years. And I think when we started at Purdue, we thought, well, we'll have this wrapped up in about six months. Um, that's the beauty of being a humanist and not a scientist or engineer. I was totally naive of the complexity and the variety of data within science and engineering. So we just jumped into it. But both of these endeavors, Odysseus and us, including insights into new places and people, some very strange and unknown, possibly and probably on both counts. In 2004, as Sarah mentioned, I arrived at Purdue from MIT, where we had worked on DSpace. And it was in the creation of DSpace that I saw librarians working with scientists and engineers and, and computer scientists and technicians to figure out how to make DSpace possible. I had never really seen that collaboration before anywhere else. And when I got to Purdue, I thought, OK, MIT is doing this. We don't need to worry about this. They're going to take care of making sure that textual materials move forward. And so I made a commitment to the provost and to myself that I would meet with every single department head on campus before I knew how many departments there were. <laughs> there are 75 departments at Purdue. And I thought, this may take a while. I started with the science and engineering departments, schools, because I thought those are the ones that I have the least background and knowledge of. Even though I've been at MIT, I still did not really understand how the research and the requirements were of science and engineering. And I would sit down with each one of the department heads, and I would ask them, what's your biggest challenge? What are your problems? And I wanted to hear what it was that we in the libraries could work to help them correct or engage them. And almost without a, a, a question or without a single exception, they would say, oh, managing data. It's, it's our biggest problem. And I said, do you mean storage? And they said, oh, no, we can store the stuff. That's not a problem. People just stick it anywhere. But we don't know how to organize it. We don't know how to share it. We don't know how to preserve it. And I spoke up very gladly, oh, we can do that. And they would look at me rather incredulously and say, really? They couldn't quite conceive of the librarians or libraries being interested in data. And I was surprised by this, that they didn't understand that that's what we're about, is that we organize, we, we create access points, we describe, and then we preserve. And I realized that we had been very remiss as a profession in not telling people what the principles and concepts are of library and archival science. People knew us by what we did, as opposed to the thinking processes that we employed. So after getting to Purdue, and I was going around meeting with all the department heads, I would ask them, is there a professor that we can work with? And they'd say, oh, yes, professor so-and-so. She, she has a lot of data, and she's always coming to me and complaining, or he's coming and complaining. If you could do something about that, that would be really great. And so I thought, well, I can't do all of this. So I turned to an individual in the libraries, Scott Brandt, who at the time was working with staff development. And I said, Scott, could you become a person who could follow and really follow up on what is happening in data? And he said, yeah, yeah. So I gave him the incredible title of interdisciplinary research librarian. And, uh, and he started going through and working with various um, follow-up projects. Then I was invited to sit on the deans, the associate deans for research council that is chaired by the vice president for research. And I went to my first meeting and I looked around and I said, but I'm the only dean here. All the rest were associate deans. And they said, well, you don't have an associate dean for research. And I said, oh, we will. <laughs> um, I went back and changed 
Scott's title to Associate Dean for Research. He went on this, onto the council. At Purdue, the librarians are full members of the faculty. And for that reason, it was easier for us to become involved in research projects. As you know, many of the, the universities and funding agencies require that if you're a principal investigator or a co-principal investigator, you need to have a faculty appointment. And our librarians had it. So we could say we can serve on committees. We can serve on, on grant proposals. We started working with various projects. And we started getting a reputation for knowing something about data. And so NSF created a panel to come together and look at the issues around data management because they were getting pressured from Congress to make sure that grants were being, and the results of grants were being used efficiently and effectively and not duplicative. So they pulled a panel together and they asked me to serve on it. And this was in 2005 or six, something like that. And we went, or I went to that, and out of that came a report, and it's the one that Sarah's alluded to, in which one of the people that was identified that needed to be housed within the university was data research scientist. And we said, okay, we're gonna create that. Now I'm getting back to the issue, issue of funding. We didn't have the funding to create this position. Uh, I had money for about half of the position for about a three-year appointment. And I said, okay, we're going to bring this person in and they're going to have to fund half of their position through grants. That had never been done in the libraries where we actually said, you got a position as long as you can figure out how to fund it. And so we did it and we hired a very talented young man, uh, Jake Carlson. Jake had no background in data, had been a social science librarian. He was our only applicant for the position. And we never told him that. Um, <laughs> we tried to drive a tough bargain, but he was our only applicant. I have to say that was the case more often than not. When we went out to advertise for people in data, we would have one person apply. That's not quite the case anymore. Well, Jake is now did some incredible things while he was with at Purdue, and he worked on the data curation profiles, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. And, uh, and in fact, he's holding a data curation profile workshop right now at Purdue as we speak. But he is now at the University of Michigan. So I, I will paraphrase a comment from Iowa. Iowa used to say, we send our best. I think they were talking about Rath Mead or something. And I said, really what it is is Purdue is now sending our best to other institutions, and we hope that that'll help everyone. Well, we had to also rethink about the reorientation of the librarians. When we started talking about doing data management, we got pushback from the librarians because they said, we don't deal with research at the inception, at the beginning. We deal with it at the end, when it comes out as an article or when it's published as a book. So I had to think about that. And I said, no, that's not true. We deal, think about all those items sitting upstairs in archives and special collections. Those are all raw bits of data. They just happen to be tangible. And we have been preserving those for the humanists and the social scientists for centuries. We now need to do the same thing for our, our colleagues in the sciences and engineering. So we brought in archival archivists to work with us. And when we go out and talk to the researchers and say, we can, we can curate your data and we can help you share it, I would get this shaking of their heads and saying, no, you can't. And I say, yes, we can. We can help you curate your data. And they said, no, you can't. And I said, yes, why do you doubt that we can do this? It's, we've been doing this for centuries. And they said, how would you know what data is accurate and is, is, is acceptable. And I said, is that what you mean by curation? That's not what we mean. We mean preserving it for the future. And they said, oh no. So we actually had to bring in a linguist to help us understand how to talk to each other. I also had a, a computer scientist say to me, Jim, you're trying to horn in on our area. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're using the term metadata. You don't really know what that is. And I said, really? I said, you know, I've been a librarian for 40 years. 
I have never, ever had another discipline claim cataloging and classification. And he said, is that what you mean? And I said, yes. We're talking about the content, describing the content in the database. We don't care about all of that software junk that's running around it. I mean, we care, but we don't really care. And, uh, and they said, oh, well, then we complement each other. I said, exactly. After a short time, computer science was one of our biggest supporters. Well, I would go to the provost every month at our monthly meeting and telling him, you've got to appoint a task force to have us look at how we're going to manage data. And he would go, yeah, yeah. Um, there's other things to do, more important. We'll get to it. And finally, I went the last time, and I said, this is it. This is the last time I'm going to say anything. Next time, you will not hear me bring up data. And he almost said, thank God. Um, but then, what should be, but that was in April of 2010, and NSF made their announcement in May of 2010 of expecting uh, data management plans. So the provost, hurriedly, um, appointed a task force with the CIO and me as co-chairs. And then he asked for senior professors from each of the college who, who were substantial recipients of grants from NSF. Both the CIO and I said to the provost, this is a recipe for failure. And he said, why? And I said, I've had enough experience with researchers. And I know there are researchers here in the audience. And I know two of them, three of them here very well. And I don't want this to sound negative. But researchers can't see anything other than their own research. And we needed them to pull back 25,000, 35,000 feet so they could look at the whole campus and the process and not what they were expect expecting themselves. And we were right. It was horrible. Um, and after about a month and a half, I said, this is not going to work. And I, I, I've used this analogy uh, several times. And I know it's been used many times for different instances. But to say that it was hurting cats is an unfair analogy to cats. <laughs> I think it would have been easier to handle cats. Um, so we kind of folded the program up, wrote a report, and then we said, we're just going to create it top down. So the CIO and I and the Vice President for Research and Sponsored Programs said, we will come together. The Vice President for Research gave us about one and a half million dollars to fund the project. We drew upon, we drew upon the, um, and that was minimal, we figured. Um, we drew upon the resources that had already been funded by an NSF grant in nanotechnology, the NanoHub. We used software that had been implemented by them to create um, a software package that would allow the research process to go from all the way from the beginning to the end, so that a team could be created, they would create their, their project, and then it would be followed all the way through. Because we knew well enough that unless this was embedded within the project, within the research project, to expect a researcher at the end to deposit their data was expecting a lot. We had to get it integrated into the process. We also had turned in a grant to NSF back in the DataNet days. And Saeed and Data One were the winners. They received grants from NSF as part of the DataNet project. Ours was given a good rating, but it was turned down because they said it was too much infrastructure and not enough research. And we said, OK, we'll just create it ourselves. That's when I went to the vice president and said, we need money. Ultimately, we created PER, the Purdue University Research Repository. When it came live, I sent a link to the program director at NSF, who had been the reviewer, one of the reviewers, or coordinated the review. And I said, does this look familiar? He looked at it and wrote back, and he said, it was your data net proposal. And I said, yes. And we did it for one and a half million instead of, what was it, 25 or 20, 20? 20 million. So we gave, them a, we gave a really good return on investment. And now PER is being coordinated and led very amply by Michael Witt, our director, our head of our distributed data curation center. Raise your hand, Mike. Okay. So over the intervening 10 years, we have created new positions as it became apparent for their need because we would find invariably one more part of the continuum that was missing. Uh, digital curation, uh, metadata, 
All of these things were pieces that were missing that we hadn't seen at the beginning, so we had to create them. Over the 10 years, we have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly side of data. But now we are seeing more of the good than the ugly. So like Odysseus, what we thought was going to be a short trip back to Ithaca or the solving of the data management challenge, we are coming close to understanding at Purdue what we must and what we can do. Unlike Odysseus, who killed Penelope's suitors, I have to say that when I first read the Odyssey, I was maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old, and I kept pronouncing her name in my mind, Penelope. Um, uh, unlike Odysseus, who killed Penelope's suitors upon his return to Ithaca and the end of his tenure travail, we at Purdue hope that all who are working to reach their Ithaca thrive and prosper. There is no one solution to the data management challenge that will serve all universities or institutions. It will vary from one to another. We hope that the experience and work we have done at Purdue will help others as they begin or continue their journey to Ithaca. Thank you very much. <laughs>